Just a few months ago, Armenia's Prime Minister Nikol Pashinyan seemed to be on his way out as mass protests filled the streets calling for his removal. Even the military publicly demanded Pashinyan resign to answer for Armenia's defeat in last year's Nagorno-Karabakh war. He eventually stepped down in April, but in a stunning comeback, Pashinyan has won a snap election. What will his second term hold for the South Caucasus region and Armenia's relations with Turkey? TRT World Diplomatic Correspondent Andrew Hopkins reports. The day after the election, it was celebration time for the Armenian Prime Minister. Despite being heavily criticised for losing a war to Azerbaijan and its ally Turkey last year, Nikol Pashinyan still had enough support to win. Last year, Armenia and Azerbaijan fought a war over the Nagorno-Karabakh region. It lasted more than 40 days. More than 6,000 soldiers were killed and Yerevan was defeated. Land taken by Armenia's forces in the 1990s, but internationally recognized as part of Azerbaijan, was largely returned to Baku's control. Thousands took to the streets calling for Pashinyan's resignation. The head of the military called for him to go in what Pashinyan called an attempted coup, as opponents criticized him for bringing the country to the brink of disaster. The end of the war brought a ceasefire deal that set out nine points. These included the deployment of close to 2,000 Russian peacekeepers to Nagorno-Karabakh, the transfer of most of the territory back to Azerbaijani control, the restoration of transport links between Azerbaijan and its exclave Nakhchivan through Armenian territory. Azerbaijan says it's now ready for talks with its neighbor. But problems remain. There are ongoing disputes about mines. Journalists were killed earlier this month when their bus hit one in part of Nagorno-Karabakh, previously controlled by Armenia. There's also decades of bad feeling to be overcome since the first war in the 1990s. What to do about the remaining Nagorno-Karabakh area and disputes over prisoners and borders? Turkey has suggested a regional six-party cooperation platform involving Turkey, Azerbaijan, Armenia, Georgia, Russia and Iran. But that also has challenges. Armenia doesn't have diplomatic relations with Turkey or Azerbaijan. And Georgia doesn't have full diplomatic relations with Russia. Karabağ zaferinin Azerbaijan ve bölge için ne anlama geldi? Önümüzdeki yıllarda daha iyi anlaşılacaktır. Burası dünyayı kendi siyasi ve ekonomik hırslarının aracı haline getirenlerin oyunlarının kırıldığı inşallah yer olacaktır. Bölgenin yeniden huzura ve istikrara kavuşmasından en çok faydayı sağlayacaklardan biri de şayet önüne çıkan fırsatı değerlendirebilirlerse Ermenistan olacaktır. The election has put Pashinyan back in charge. But it's still not clear where he will take relations with Azerbaijan and Turkey or the wider region. Andrew Hopkins, Straight Talk. And to break down where Armenia is headed from Istanbul, I'm joined by Mitat Çelikpala. He is a professor at Kadir Has University. And from Yerevan, Richard Gregosian. He is the director of the Regional Studies Center, an independent think tank in Armenia. Gentlemen, welcome to Straight Talk. It's good to... Have you on the program? Mita, what's your take on Pashinyan's victory and what does his re-election mean for Armenia as well as for the region? Yeah, uh, thank you, thank you. It's, it's very nice to be uh, with you uh, and of course, Richard. The results of Armenia's parliamentary elections uh, in fact surprised many observers both in Armenia and abroad. Uh, we observed what's happened in, in Turkey as well. This, despite this devastating defeat in 2020 Nagorno-Karabakh war, under his leadership, uh, Pashinyan uh, secured a decisive electoral victory. Of course, 
the turnout is low, less than 50 percent, but he managed to uh, win the elections. This is very important. Uh, and his party won more than half of the votes compared to only 21 percent for Armenia's alliance. And what is important is uh, he is going to form a single party government and remain as a prime minister uh, with a constitutional majority in support yes. uh, in the Armenian parliament. And this is very important. And this is a real power to take some concrete political decisions in, in, for him. So, so uh, Richard, give us some political insight. Why do you think Armenians voted for a politician who many blamed for losing last year's uh, Nagorno-Karabakh war? What are the inner dynamics uh, in Armenia's polit politics? Well, first and foremost, the secret to success of Nikol Pashinyan since his ascendance to power in a nonviolent revolution in 2018, his secret has always been to be underestimated. And in this election, it was no different. The opposition is also widely unpopular and discredited. And the contest was a choice between going back to the past and looking to the future. In this way, the vote for Pashinyan was as much a vote against the old, corrupt, former authoritarian leadership. Mm. But we are optimistic that we're moving forward at this stage. So, I mean, how do you think he has managed to stave off efforts by the army uh, who wanted to remove him? I mean, in a sense, has he defeated a coup? Well, I wouldn't even give it the credibility of a coup d'etat. In other words, there is no real alternative to Pashinyan. And let's be honest, he had no choice but to accept a Russian-imposed ceasefire agreement. Mm -hmm. At the same time, we are in unprecedented political waters. But yet again, whether it was the opposition or the army, it was a victory for democracy. Yes. So, Mitat, now that uh, Azerbaijan gained its territory from Armenia, what's next moving forward for both countries as well as for the region? Yeah, as I said, uh, legally, this is a real power to take some concrete political decisions in front of uh, Pashinyan himself. Uh, it seems that he's much more powerful than his previous term in the office. But this is also means that he has to take the sole responsibility for continuing the difficult negotiations with Azerbaijan over Nagorno-Karabakh issue, normalizing the Armenian politics and economy, and more than that, he has to craft a new army in foreign and security policies. Mm -hmm. These are very important issues. And how? The question is that what the Armenian society is expecting from him, what are the priorities of his new government? And we can comment on this result by saying that Armenian society or public opinion want peace, uh, not war. And then dialogue and negotiations with Azerbaijan has become an only smart option for Pashinyan. And it seems that Baku is ready to negotiate with Pashinyan as well. And how to balance Azerbaijan, Nagorno-Karabakh issue, negotiations and political uh, environment within Armenia is the, the most important thing in front of uh, Pashinyan himself for mm -hmm. the next, uh, next term. So what are the expectations of Armenian people, um, Richard, and of course the Armenian uh, government, because Armenia has an ailing economy and... Uh, I believe that as a prime minister, he would like to revive that ailing economy. What he, could he do and could Azerbaijan's offer to sit at the negotiations table will help Armenia to reconcile with its neighbors as well as um, other regional countries? Well, clearly there's no choice and no alternative but a return to diplomatic negotiations. And we do stand ready and willing to meet with Azerbaijan and all neighbors in terms of pushing a diplomatic solution moving forward. But this is straight talk, so let me talk straight in terms of the reality. Armenia is still in a state of denial, failing to adjust to the post-war reality. At the same time, the state of war is lingering in Armenia because Azerbaijan still unilaterally holds a number of prisoners of war and civilian hostages mm -hmm. until we can actually facilitate that return of prisoners, it's unlikely we're going to be able to achieve much in any immediate time frame. So, 
Uh, yes, you, you kind of drew a uh, realistic as well as a grim picture. But I mean, Mittal, if some star, sort of a rapprochement is reached between Yerevan and Baku, would it also bring Armenia and Turkey closer in future? Uh, it's a possibility because, you know, uh, the, the limitation in front of Turkey to establish contacts with Armenia politically and diplomatically is, is Nagorno-Karabakh issue. This is a, a kind of a hint in front of us. But of course, Armen Armenian response is also important. And Turkey and Azerbaijan, you know, declared the expansion and deepening of bilateral relations by examining all aspects mm -hmm. from economy to trade and from security to political relations. Uh, this is whole package and the parties will boost cooperation, especially against terrorism, organized crime, drug trafficking, illegal immigration, but the military cooperation as well. And there is a room, a kind of a commercial and economic cooperation room for Armenia as well. Mm -hmm. And this is the reason last week the president himself, Turkish president, offered in, 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 in Nagorno-Karabakh that we hope Armenia will grasp this hand and extend a kind of a solidarity. Uh, this is an opportunity. Uh, what we will see, any kind of a rapprochement or resolution of issues, a dialogue between Armenia and Azerbaijan has a kind of a potential to, to reflect its uh, very positively on Turkish-Armenian relations. So, Richard, how do you think the U.S. president's remarks on uh, 1915 events affected both Armenian politics as well as uh, the public opinion? And has this hampered any prospects of a reconciliation between the two countries or provided a room for the two to get together? Well, I would argue as someone who has long supported the normalization of relations between Armenia and Turkey, I'm justifiably optimistic. First, we see the major obstacle to normalization during the protocol process was now no longer applicable. The post-war reality regarding Nagorno-Karabakh and Azerbaijan makes it more likely, not less likely, in terms of a re-engagement diplomatically. Second, I do think the Biden statement was important for the United States. In terms of the Armenian perspective, as important as it was, it was secondary. And it does make every future April 24th that much divisive and that much decisive in terms of recommitting to what we see, practical normalization with no preconditions mm -hmm. from the Armenian side. All right, so uh, let's talk about uh, Russia. Do you think Russia would like any reconciliation mitat among uh, Turkey, Azerbaijan and Armenia? And how has Armenia's defeat in Nagorno-Karabakh consolidated Russian influence over the region? And what kind of ramifications we're likely to see when it comes to relations with Turkey and Russia? I guess so. First of all, Moscow, most probably, I can say that seems satisfied with, with the outcome of elections, which means Pashinyan. Uh, neither Pashinyan nor Kocharyan threatens Russian interest in the region or in Armenia. Uh, but I can say that Pashinyan is preferable for Moscow when it comes to negotiations with Azerbaijan because he's more predictable. Uh, and the, the Kremlin wouldn't have risked its reputation with the Armenian public by pushing through an, an, an unpopular candidate in Armenia. And most probably, uh, Russia needs to, or Moscow, the Kremlin needs to show the public opinion in, in, the, in the broader caucuses that they are supporting any kind of reconciliation within the region, with the support of Turkey or not. Uh, mm -hmm. Therefore, Turkey, as a partner country in the region, helps Russian uh, legality, uh, let me say, or the activities within within the caucuses in general and, and within uh, Armenia and, 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 of course, Baku, yes. I have to say that. So, Richard, where do you think the Minsk group stands now? I mean, has this latest war in Nagorno-Karabakh rendered it futile? Well, I would say no. In many ways, in terms of a return to diplomacy, even Russia, after a unilateral deployment of Russian peacekeepers, will be anxious to bring back the Americans to legitimize the Russian deployment and also will welcome the European engagement in terms of paying the price of post-war stability. What's interesting, however, though, Armenia-Turkey may be the missing ingredient, may be the key to unlocking the restoration of trade and transport. Mm. And in many ways, the stars are realigning in terms of even normalization being now in Russia's interest. 
Nevertheless, the longer term threat to Turkey and Armenia is a rather dangerous Russian military buildup. And I do think it's a consideration we have to keep into account. All right, gentlemen, unfortunately, we'll have to leave it here. Thank you very much for joining us on Straight Talk.